Hi, coming up next on wood carving, we'll be putting the finishing details on our American Eagle. So don't go away. Hi, come on in. My name is Rick Boots. Welcome to Wood Carving. Today we're going to be putting on the finishing details of the American Eagle that we started last week. And what I've done in the meantime is I've gone through and finished establishing our levels that we talked about in our relief carving. As you may remember, one of the things we talked about was in starting a relief carving, you want to figure out your carving so that the high spots, like the talons, appear the highest in the carving. And then progressive they get lower and lower down and you want to establish all these general shapes like the curve of the scroll and the tail before you begin doing the details and that's what I've done here I've gone through and established all of our major shapes here and now we can start doing our details one of the more interesting things with the eagles is carving the feathers and what I've done is just kind of sketch those in from the pattern and then it's just a matter of carving them. There's a couple ways you can do it, but the easiest way is to take a macaroni gouge and just incise along the edge. Now the macaroni gouge is kind of interesting because it's kind of box shaped. And you have a much flatter, broader surface at the bottom than the V tools that we've been using, which are pretty much just a sharp V. So the nice thing about this is we can go along and we can bevel that down a little bit and we can make a cut that shows the outline of the feather and lowers the section next to it to make it look like it's overlapping feathers. And we can do that with one cut. This will save you a lot of time. Now, I didn't worry too much about the outline of the feathers at the bottom of the wings. I just cut that out and left that kind of smooth and general. When I get the feathers carved in, then I can go through with a knife and just round off those bottoms. And that makes it a lot easier than if you're trying to match your feathers to lines that were already cut in the bottom of the, uh, of the wing there, of the edge. The thing to remember about feathers is that they overlap each other, kind of like shingles on a roof. And the ones on top overlap the ones in the row next to it and on down until you get down to the bottom edge. Don't worry too much about making the feathers exactly like the ones in the pattern. This was something that the old wood carvers generally used a lot of their own interpretation on. And sometimes they just kind of go with the flow as to how they work out in conjunction with the shape of the wing. Now, as we mentioned last week, this carving with the slogan, Free Trade and Sailors' Rights, was from the War of 1812. And one of the big problems that Americans had with the War of 1812 was, well, there had been wars going on between France and England, and all those countries have been warring for so long that... Uh, America was trying to stay out of getting in these squabbles. And one of the problems was the British ships needed manpower. And not only would they harass the American vessels and maybe confiscate the uh, cargo or confiscate the ships sometimes, I guess, if they could get away with it, they would also impress the sailors. And that's not like uh, making them go, wow. They would actually Shanghai them and say, hey, you're a British seaman. The rationale for that was a lot of the, uh, they thought a lot of British seamen were on American ships. So theoretically, they were just collecting deserters. Well, a lot of them weren't deserters, they were American citizens too. And that annoyed the Americans, justifiably so. The other thing that the British were doing were blockading some of the ports. So the cry, free trade and sailors' rights, was one of the uh, 
one of the slogans that the people used as a, uh, well, as a rallying cry to, to try and get things done. And there was a group of politicians called the Warhawks. They're mostly from the south and uh, western states. Henry Clay was one of the, uh, the leaders of that. And they finally decided the only way to resolve this was to actually declare war and go to war. So on June 18th, 1812, they declared war. Now, some people thought this was a big mistake. We didn't really have much of an army at that time, and we really didn't have the funds for carrying on a large-scale war. But it went ahead anyway. The, uh, the land battles, from what I recall, didn't go too well. One of the plans they had was uh, they're going to attack Canada and make Canada part of America. And with an army of 10,000 men, you just can't do that kind of a land battle. Where they did make some very brilliant successes was in the naval situation. And Britain had a world-renowned navy, and they didn't think too much of anyone else's navy, especially the colonialists. And after Earth, they met a few of the ships like Old Ironsides, the USS Constitution, um, they began taking the American Navy a little more seriously. Well, anyway, that's basically how we do the feathers there. When you get to this point on the carving, I just kind of work all around it. And we can do the same thing putting the feathers like along the neck using exactly the same technique. Now, these are a little smaller, so I'm going to make them just a a little smaller here because the feathers on the neck of a bird, particularly the bald eagle, are finer than the wing feathers. Anyway, that's the general idea. Now, for doing the finishing details on these feathers, you can take a V-gouge, gouge, and that's what we talked about last week. That's just sort of shaped like a little bit of a V. And you can go down and inscribe the shaft down the center. And while you have it in your hand, you can go and make a couple of feather breaks there. And that gives the texture and the illusion of the feathers. Ooh, one of the biggest battles, I want to mention this, one of the best naval battles for the Americans was for Lake Champlain. And what the British had planned to do was to send a force up the Hudson River and go up through Lake George. And another force coming down from Canada, going through Lake Champlain and linking up through Lake George. And what they planned to do was basically cut the United States at that time in half. And it's a very bold move, and it might have worked. The Lake George and uh, Lake Champlain there have been battles fought over those waters since the days of the French and Indian Wars because it was the only real waterway in which you could move large amounts of troops and cannon and whatever um, any distance because everything else was, well, like the Adirondacks, it was all mountains and forest, and you just can't move cannons and troops through mountains and forests very well. Thomas McDonough was in charge of the American fleet and met the British at the part of Lake Champlain near uh, Plattsburgh, and it's called the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay, and had a decisive victory, at which point the expedition force that was coming down from the north said, hey, nuts with this. We're not going to have any supplies, and they went back. And that made a big difference in the outcome of this whole battle. So anyway, it was kind of an inconclusive battle, but makes good history, and also gave the United States sort of a sense of its own identity and national spirit. So hence, free trade and sailors' rights. The face is kind of a fun part on this eagle, and to detail it, we can take our macaroni gouge and carve around the nose here. And shape that. 
And this is where you can start putting your own personal interpretation in on your carving. And I'll go to a V tool here because it's a little deeper to outline the beak. Now the beak is kind of tricky because it's sort of a narrow opening. And the best way to do that is to outline it with your tool and then narrow the back, shape the back so the beak is kind of thin and just get in there with a pocket knife and carve that out. And that works pretty well. We can take our, uh, let's use our macaroni tool here and do his brow. So you see, when you get to doing the details on these, the V tools and the macaroni tools, anything that gives you a sharp angle is really the tool of choice. It's a very handy tool for doing details. Even on little carvings, it's great because you can size lines, you can uh, carve feathers, you can carve all sorts of little details on any size carving. The problem with a V gouge is some people find them a little frustrating to sharpen. Some of the other gouges, if it's mostly sharp, it'll work. A V gouge won't cut unless it's perfectly sharp right down to the tip of that little V. Let me take a minute and show you how you can touch that up. Last time we talked a little bit about sharpening, particularly with a gouge, so we're doing a back and forth motion. A V gouge, because you're dealing with a flat side, takes a different type of a motion. And that's it. Let me get a little bigger one that'll be easier to see. Ah, here we go. For sharpening a V gouge, you treat it like a chisel and just work it back and forth on the stone. And you want that about a 20 degree angle. And you just work that back and forth. On the other side, you work that back and forth and kind of do that evenly. Now, as with the other tools, eventually when you're using one of these uh, man-made India stones, it'll raise a little bit of a burr and just run your finger away from that cutting edge and you'll feel a little ridge of metal there. When you can feel that, that means that it's as sharp as the stone's gonna make it. But you're still only about halfway there. When you're done with the stone, just put a, a lid on it, put it away to keep the dust off. A cedar box, by the way, makes a very good cover for uh, a sharpening stone. It's impervious to the oil. To take the burr off, you can take a slipstone, and this is a, uh, a triangular slipstone that fits right inside the V, and just hold it about a 45 degree angle and gently draw it against that burr edge. What we're doing is actually putting on a micro bevel. That's fancy talk, it doesn't mean a whole lot, except we're putting on a little sharper angle there that's so slight it won't affect the cutting at all. Now sometimes when you're sharpening this, you'll get a bit of metal at the end here that forms sort of a hook. And when that happens, just work that on the sharpening stone until it disappears and then go and hone it and take the burr away. When that burr is gone, then we can polish it. And to do that, we'll take our strop. And this is one that I designed. It's got a little angled edge on here. And uh, you can buy these or you can make them. Uh, just cut your piece of wood and wrap a piece of leather around it. And then take and stroke that away from the cutting edge. And that will polish it to a razor sharp edge. And that's what you need when you're working the V tool. You can use the flat side for getting the flat sides of this and the center portion. I usually go a couple strokes this way, do a few on the center and do a few on that side and just keep that up until it's razor sharp. The way to test for that is to take and make a practice cut in a piece of soft wood. And if it's sharp, it'll cut across the grain and give you a nice little curl. If it's dull at all, you'll get a lot of tearing with it. So that's one way to tell.
Now on this carving here, when we're getting into the portion of the neck here in these hollow spots, the best way to get into there is to use a curved gouge like, oh, it's like a number nine or something. Something that's curved that'll fit in there. And you can just get in there and work away. And the tighter the curve, uh, the smaller the, the U shape is that you want on it. And that's how we get in there to do the neck. And then help shape it. One other thing I wanted to mention here is um, we're talking about establishing our levels last time. And one of the things I mentioned was how it's nice to be able to use the same tool as much as you can. And this one we have where the neck comes down and then joins into the body. You have a little S turn there. You can take a gouge and do one side of that S shape and then just flip it over and use the other side of the gouge to do the other half. And that way you get an S shaped gouge with the same um, tool here. I'm going to set this in. Once our vertical cut is made, we can take our tool and go in there. And separate that. Sometimes if you're not going down too deep, you don't even need the milling. Just take your tool and rock it a little bit. And that's how we separate the uh, body from the wings in this section. Then, away. Then when you get around to where you want, just sketch in your feathers and draw your feathers. Um, the talons is something else that we worked on last week. And now that I have them shaped out, you can round off the angular shapes on them. Coming from the other way here, I can start to feel that wood split a little bit. The nice thing about doing a carving like this, there's so many different shapes and angles that you're working with, you really develop a good feeling and sensitivity for the grain of the wood. And then we can take our V tool and carve out the line between the talons or the toes or whatever. And again, come around and draw the claws. Basically, we're just drawing with this tool. Now to round that, I could just go and round that straight away and then texture it. But I can also just do that in one step. And I'm using a small tool here. Uh, a small number eight gouge, which has a fair amount of curve to it. And by making little slight scooping motions, I can texture that so it looks like scales. And it also rounds it at the same time. These old wood carvers that were making these, boy, they, they had so many little techniques and tricks for doing it. Let me come around here and do it from the other side. That's the fun part about doing this. Once you get all the levels established, you can just go around and play and draw and have all sorts of fun with it. And then for doing the lines here, easiest thing to do is just take and incise those with your V-tool. And this is where you want it sharp, so you want it to cut nice and even. A uh, dull tool is going to give you some frustration here. And if it's too dull, you have to push extra hard, and it's hard to, not to overcut your lines and go 
which we don't want to do. The other thing I wanted to show you was how you can make these stars. One of the tricks for doing these stars is kind of fun. Is we can take a V tool. In this case, I'm going to use that um, that one we just sharpened up. Where'd I put that? Right here. It's nice when you're doing these to lay your tools out in a sense of order because you get a dozen tools out that you're working with, uh, and you don't have a pattern for it. You can waste a lot of time looking for your tools. For doing the star, I just kind of sketch it out. And then I make a cut in from each side towards the center. And and that gives us a star. No pain, no strain. We can use the same thing for the lettering, but I'm going to do that later. One of the other problems that a lot of people have with a design like this is doing a scroll. And I'm going to take just a minute and show you how we can do that. Technically, the stroll isn't hard to do. It just takes a little, little bit of thinking because it's a different shape than what we're used to. I'm going to start out by incising down with a tool that, whose sweep matches that curve. And after you've incised down, then you cut, make a horizontal cut in. Sometimes you can also use a smaller tool for doing that. It's really not hard to carve, but you know, trying to take a block of wood and see a curved, twisted shape in it uh, takes a little practice and you sort of have to work on faith for a while. And just keep doing that until you get it down to the depth you want. Now, one tool that's very handy for using with the scrolls that isn't something that you use very often is called a back bent gouge. And this is a tool and it's shaped like a spoon gouge, except the cutting edge is reversed. And instead of cutting like this, it cuts like this. I know it sounds a little confusing, doesn't it? But where it's handy is you can come in and use that to clean down and undercut the side of a scroll. You can take this and you can actually cut way underneath here to give it a, a very thin edge, which in turn enhances the illusion of a thin folded piece of metal. Now the lettering is another thing that I want to show you. Remember how we did that uh, star just a minute ago? What you can do is take your V gouge and you can take and make a line and just incise those. When you get to the serifs, just bring it down a little bit. angling that down, you create a deep cut. Then take a knife or a skew chisel and just cut that clear and you can make the serifs. And then you can uh, just go through and lay out your lettering. Now, when you get that all done, for painting it, what I did was I used acrylic paint, white and uh, red and blue, 
And I also used an acrylic gold on here. The lettering I painted in red enamel. And the nice thing about that is if it spills over on the acrylic, which is water-based, you can take a little turpentine and clean that off. And then I just coated the rest with the stain. And there's your War of 1812 Eagle. It takes a little time, but it's a really impressive piece when you have it finished. Next week, we're going to do a little bit something different with the animals. And we're going to be making this little red fox. And I'll be showing you how to texture the fur to make it look soft and fluffy. Hey, thanks for dropping by. I've had a great time talking with you. Until next time, I'm Rick Boots, wishing you happy carving. Rick Boots has written two books entitled Wood Carving Step by Step, Woodland Creatures and Santas. Rick demonstrates and describes through extensive illustrations and photographs how to carve a chipmunk, a river otter, a red fox, an alpine St. Nicholas, an Adirondack Santa and his bear, and a Swiss St. Nicholas. The two-book collection is available by calling 1-800-950-9648. The price is $29.90 plus shipping and handling.